I uh, just want to talk a, a little bit about what drinking water has to be. It needs to be safe, aesthetically acceptable, and I'll define that in, the, in a moment. There has to be enough of it, it has to be affordable, and it has to be sustainable. Now, when Hans called me and said, could you, uh, could you speak on, on this subject for me, please? And you've got 45 minutes. I thought, wow, I mean, I could put on a whole conference just on this one subject here. So I thought, okay, what, what can I do to most help people here in terms of understanding drinking water treatment? I thought maybe the best thing is just to give you an overview of the various processes, the, the things that are out there, and their, their advantages and their limitations for your own consideration, and also if other engineers, consultants, and people show up at your door and say, this is what we think you should do, at least then you'll have some idea of, of hopefully what they're talking about. To, to cover the subject, I'm just going to focus on the two aspects that are probably the most important for, from a treatment point of view, and that's to make the water safe and aesthetically acceptable. By safe, what we mean is it doesn't have enough stuff in the water. There's always going to be things in the water, but enough of it in the water that's detrimental to your health, and that's both organisms and, and chemicals. And aesthetically acceptable is a little trickier, but what it means is the water itself is, is pleasant to consume, but more importantly, it's such that the customers believe that it is safe to drink. Because if, as we heard yesterday, if you don't have faith and trust in your drinking water, there's no point in, in making it. This is one of Hans's photographs at the bottom here. It shows two glasses of water. The point we want to make here is that the glass on the left looks pretty bad, kind of yellow tea looking like, like water. The glass on the, on the right is, has water and it looks very nice. From, a, from a, a treatment point of view, that glass on the left could be just fine to drink, perfectly safe, and the glass on the right could be lethal. So you can't judge by how the water looks, but for your customers, it's how the water looks and tastes and smells that is their guide to have the trust that it works. There's, as Hans mentioned in his presentation yesterday, there's about 80 different parameters in the Canadian guidelines, and outside of that, there's a whole bunch of others as well. Again, we could talk about this for, for weeks. Uh, however, it really comes down to several that, that are the most common. And they are the microbes, which you've all heard about bacteria, viruses, and protozoa now. Disinfection byproducts, which are formed when a disinfectant reacts with stuff that's already in the water. And that stuff are, are typically referred to as precursors. Color, taste and odor, turbidity, which is a measure of, if, essentially it's a measure of how clear the water is. Technically, it's not quite that. Uh, iron and manganese, lead, copper, hardness, arsenic, and sodium. So these are kind of our normal group of uh, things that we have to worry about. Taking it one step further, we look at the importance of the parameters. The, the bar on the left is the health risk. At the bottom, it's very, very safe. At the top, it'll, it'll kill you if you drink it. Uh, on, the, on the horizontal bar, we're talking about how long you need to be exposed to this, this uh, particular parameter. <coughs> Either a very short time, like one glass of water, out to almost a lifetime. What's interesting is the, the, the microbes can be life-threatening very, very quickly. You can have one glass full of water that contains E. coli and, and it could literally kill you. On the other hand, you can drink hard water pretty much all your life and you'll be fine. Uh, you'll die of other things. Now, when we go to, to treat water, we have to decide which standards have to be followed. And our, our foundation are the Canadian provincial or territorial standards. But these, in turn, are drawn from the guidelines for Canadian drinking water quality, at least in most provinces. In turn, some of the provinces and also the guidelines refer a lot to the US EPA's Safe Water Drinking Act, which in itself has a whole class of rules that, that are, have to be followed in the states. And there's the World Health Organization rules. And we also sometimes refer to the European standards and the Australian standards. And as, I don't know if you can read the subtitle there, is that, but one nice thing about standards is there are so many of them. But what it really boils down to is that you've got to get the microbes out of the water. That top left part of that, of that uh, chart there, which showed the most life-threatening short exposure criteria. And there are two ways of getting rid of them. You can either disinfect them, which is either to kill them or inactivate them so they can't reproduce, or physically remove them. And the easiest way to remember it 
is you can either zap them or you can trap them. So if you walk out of here, remember zap them, trap them. That's basically all the technologies I'm going to talk about today are either zap them technologies or trap them technologies. Now, how does an engineer go about deciding what process to select? And you may think they pick the most expensive one because they want to make the most money. Um, not always true. It's tempting. Uh, anyway, number one, it has to achieve the desired quality. So if, obviously, if it's not going to do the job, there's no point in doing it. Also, it's very important that that process be geared to the particular application in terms of operation and maintenance. Large cities have huge resources. They can afford university trained people, pay them $100,000 a year, have scientists on staff, laboratories. They can put in pretty complicated processes and make them work reliably. If you're 200 kilometers away from the nearest town in a small community and you have to make a system work reliably, that level of technology and complexity just isn't practical. So that has to be kept in mind when we're picking our processes. The process needs to be robust, and by that I mean things in the world are going to happen to that process that no one ever envisioned would, would happen. And it's how well it can react and respond to those, those unforeseen conditions and, and keep working well. The flexibility is, in turn, the tool that the operator has to adjust the process and make it deal with these uh, situations when they occur. Uh, yesterday we heard yes, uh, about the number of barriers. Uh, Dr. Schindler mentioned that, that you, you want to have a good barrier in your, in your watershed. The treatment process itself needs to have barriers to these pathogens and contaminants getting through, and then you need to protect that water out to your distribution system and right out to your customer. So the number of barriers that the treatment process provides is important. Whatever process we pick has to be blessed and, and uh, approved by the regulators. So we might come up with some wonderful process that's been used in Taiwan and go to uh, uh, Sask Environment, and they're not going to be too thrilled about it in terms of uh, getting it approved. You have to be able to access industry support. Parts have to be available. Vendors have to, be come out, have to be able to come out and troubleshoot and fix the, uh, fix the uh, system when it goes wrong. And you need to be able to get trained operators. Cost is also important, but notice it's not on the top of the list, but it is obviously an important parameter, both the capital cost and what it costs you to run the system. And finally, increasingly we're recognizing that water treatment plants pollute. When we're taking stuff out of the water to make the water safe to drink, that stuff we've taken out doesn't disappear. It has to be managed, it has to be put somewhere that it's safe and it can't hurt the environment or hurt people. As we heard from Dr. Suzuki yesterday, we are part of the environment. Uh, and, and also they need to be efficient in terms of using the least resources in terms of power and chemical and the water itself. So that's quite a long list. And those are things that hopefully you can take home and, and think about when someone's looking at a, at a water project. First and foremost though, you should look at watershed protection and Dr. Schindler mentioned this. The reason is that the best treatment is no treatment at all. If you don't have to treat your water very much, it's going to be affordable, it's going to be sustainable, and, and you're, you're going to have confidence in your water supply. It's also good, obviously, for the uh, rest of the environment. And it is possible to achieve very high quality water through watershed protection. Examples, New York, Victoria, Vancouver, all have very what, sort of enviable uh, watersheds. And what you can do there is you can make sure that you keep the, the human component out of your water. The, the uh, wastewater plants won't be discharging upstream. Uh, you won't be bringing bugs into the water from, from people. Downsides to watershed protection, though, are, are generally pra practical concerns. Uh, you're still going to have naturally occurring toxins and pathogens. Uh, there'll be animals out in the watershed, and they will do what animals do, and you'll wind up drinking it. Uh, you can have natural events. Uh, one of the problems Vancouver has to deal with is uh, landslides up in their watershed will create huge turbidity spikes very quickly. Uh, and that has led to uh, an increase in gastrointestinal illness. It's been proven there. Accidents may happen. You may get, have people accidentally wander into your watershed. Uh, you may have uh, a road that goes by the watershed that drains into it, that a truck has an accident and spills a chemical or, or whatever. But the biggest problem for most people is, is the competing demands. And uh, on, on the bus, we saw a tape, one of the nature of things uh, about uh, the Mikasu and how they're having to deal with the, the oil sands. That's an extreme example of, of competing watershed demands. But everywhere, agriculture, industry, recreational use, 
are all uses on watersheds that impact the requirements for drinking water. The last thing I want to talk about before we get into the real technologies is the difference between groundwater and surface water. It's a, just a basic classification, but groundwater, out on the prairies here, it's available in many locations. Uh, and a true groundwater, which means one that is not under the influence of the surface, is likely path pathogen free. It doesn't have viruses, bacteria, or protozoa in it. They also have a consistent raw water quality. And one of the things I like to say about yellow quill, it has one of the worst raw water sources there, but it's consistently bad. And that's very, very powerful for the treatment process. It enables this process to work very well. Limitations for groundwater is that they may have some very high levels of chemicals, high, usually inorganic chemical, but not always, uh, but iron, hardness, manganese, uh, arsenic, radon. It may be expensive to lift it out of the ground. If it's down several hundred meters in, in, in the ground, it's going to cost you a lot to lift it up to the surface. The rock may not be very porous, and so you need a lot of wells uh, to get the amount of water you need, which, which costs money. But the biggest concern is if it's under the surface influence, which means, and Walkerton, by the way, was a classic example of a groundwater under uh, influence, where there's a connection between what goes on on the surface and the groundwater that you take out. And that provides a path, typically for pathogens, to get down into the groundwater, and then you can wind up uh, drinking it. Surface water, on the other hand, if you're near a stream or a lake, you can usually access as much water as, as you need at any one particular instant. Uh, well, there are some other issues regarding that, but won't go into them right now. Usually has lower levels of the uh, inorganic chemicals, but it is part of the biosphere. There's a lot of biological activity usually on a surface water that you have to deal with. The pathogens will be there. And it's very likely to see changes in quality, either through weather events or uh, snow melt, uh, that kind of thing. Now we get into the into the various technologies. I'm going to talk, start with the uh, with the Zapim technologies, and chlorine, which is by far and away the most fundamental of the disinfectants. Advantages: it's very common. You can get it very easily in various forms. It's well proven, well tested, been in use for over a hundred years now, and it's easy to get trained people who know how to run a chlorine system. The reason why chlorine is so popular is it's very good at treating uh, bacteria and viruses. And those are the most prevalent uh, uh, pathogens that are out there. It provides a residual. It's one of really three of the, uh, the disinfectants that does this. What's important about a residual is we have what's called a primary disinfectant and a secondary disinfectant. The primary disinfectant kills or inactivates the bugs. After that, though, we need to add a residual to the water that carries uh, and protects the water or is carried in the water and protects the water through to the consumer. Because out in the distribution system, there'll be biofilm, there'll be bugs living out there, and you want to keep the, uh, the water disinfected. Chlorine's relatively inexpensive, and it can actually treat some types of taste and odor, although that's a fairly minor advantage in most uh, situations. <coughs> its limitations, though, is it really isn't that great for protozoa. It, it, it can be worked, and, in, and the regulations are such that it has to work, uh, to take out Giardia, but it's practically ineffective uh, for Cryptosporidium, and, and that's, that's its Achilles heel. It also forms byproducts if the right stuff is available in the water, and on prairie runoff water, we get the right stuff. Uh, the precursors are there to form trihalomethanes and haloacetic acids, and these are the two groups that are of most concern. Long-term exposure has been linked to uh, increased rates of certain types of cancer <coughs> and also increased rates of miscarriages with, with uh, pregnant women. It's a very hazardous material in its gaseous form. There are other alternatives like uh, calcium hypochlorite or sodium hypochlorite that are uh, easier to handle. And while it can sometimes cure some taste and odor problems in other applications, it can create them, and uh, that needs to be dealt with as well. Closely related to chlorine is chloramine. And chloramine is basically made by adding ammonia to, to chlorine. And if you have ammonia in your raw water, it's going to form whether you want it to or not. And it's often termed the, as combined uh, chlorine. The pluses of, of chloramine is it gives a very good long-lasting residual. So it's often used as a secondary disinfectant because it'll carry right through the distribution system very well. It's also been shown that it provides better biofilm control than free chlorine out in the, in the distribution system. Generally, you have a better tasting water. Properly applied chloramine doesn't have any of that kind of chlorine taste that people complain about in, 
in uh, chlorinated water, doesn't form trihalomethanes, which is one reason why there's a huge move towards using chloramine, particularly in the United States, where they have the disinfectant disinfection byproducts rule that they're having to deal with. And the haloacetic acids form extremely slowly compared to, uh, to chlorine. Sounds great. Problem with chloramine is it's very weak as a primary disinfectant. It doesn't do a very good job compared to chlorine at killing those bacteria and viruses, and is pretty much useless at protozoa. If you're making a change from chlorine to chloramine, there's a few things you have to do. Uh, you have to let people on kidney dialysis machines know that you're making the change, uh, because it'll be toxic unless they, they take it out of the water. Same thing with people with tropical fish. Uh, the, the chemical they usually use for dechlorinating may need to be changed, uh, depending on what chemical they've been using. It's a more persistent chemical, and it is more toxic to aquatic life. And so if you have a large spill, and you have fish bearing rivers and creeks, if that water gets in those creeks, it, it can create a fish kill, which is uh, very undesirable. And if you have the improper feed of ammonia, it can create a very swimming pool-like water taste, uh, which is very unpleasant, and also lead to nitrification, which encourages biofilm growth uh, out in the distribution system. It's fairly easy to avoid these problems, but, uh, but they can occur. Ultraviolet lights come out of, well, I wouldn't say come out of nowhere, but uh, it's, it was used in small applications for many years for disinfecting bacteria. It was thought to be in a, in uneconomical, probably the right word, uh, for taking out protozoa until 1998 when research was done that showed a very low dosage of uh, UV could actually inactivate protozoa. And since then, it's become a very, very popular uh, option for, for protozoa. It's very simple. You're basically shining light down a pipe. It's quite economical because it doesn't take a lot of energy. It doesn't require any chemicals to be added to the water. There are no known byproducts at this point, uh, although we've really only had six years of experience with it at, at this stage. But people are looking very, very hard to find byproducts. But at the low dosages that are used, nothing's been found. But its limitations are it's not that great on some viruses unless you use quite a bit of UV light. As I mentioned, only six years experience, of which pr pretty much only four years for plants actually being, having been built. There are no firm standards here in, uh, here in North America, although there are draft standards available now. No residual is formed, so you have to add chlorine or chloramine or chlorine dioxide afterwards. And it doesn't eliminate any of the precursors, so when you add that chlorine, uh, you will get the disinfection byproducts forming. Chlorine dioxide uh, is a pretty good disinfectant as well, except it's not so good with crypto if the water is cold. Uh, the chemical reactions slow down and the, the crypto can make it through. It can be used to provide a residual, but it's not used very often for that. Uh, it's not pH sensitive, which uh, is important if you're dealing with, with chlorine, which is pH sensitive. Very low formation of trihalomethanes and haloacetic acids. And it can be used for some other things too, such as uh, removal of color, manganese, and taste and odor, which is where I've used it before, is for taste and odor control. Downside of chlorine dioxide, though, uh, it's, little, it's quite a bit more expensive than, than chlorine. You have to generate it on site using sodium chloride, and that's chloride and not chloride. Sodium chloride is salt, which is pretty easy to deal with. Sodium chloride is a pretty un unstable chemical and can be a bit of a handle, uh, hazard to handle. It also creates its own set of disinfection byproducts, chlorate and chlorite, and in, under certain circumstances can actually create some rather interesting taste and odor problems. So for that reason, it's not used very frequently as a secondary disinfectant. Ozone uh, is O3, uh, three oxygen molecules bond, bonded together, very unstable, uh, powerful disinfectant. You make it on site because it's so unstable uh, using either the oxygen from the air or you can buy liquid oxygen, which uh, works better in terms of uh, generation. The advantages are it's a very powerful disinfectant. It's, it's extremely unstable, very, very happy to react with many things. And it does a good job of knocking out everything, but again, cryptosporidium under very cold water conditions. No trihalomethanes are formed. It actually removes taste from the water very effectively, reduces color, uh, but its downsides or is, it has the highest cost of, of all of the disinfectants. It's very power intensive, although newer, newer systems as they're being developed are uh, certainly becoming less expensive to use. 
has its own set of disinfection byproducts which uh, have to be managed and it also forms assimilable organic carbon. What it does is it breaks the organics down into a form that becomes food for the bugs that are out there in the, in the system. So you, you can get large biofilm growths uh, unless this is dealt with. And the way it's normally dealt with is either to add granular activated carbon or GAC contactors or biological filters uh, to uh, strip the uh, assimilable organic carbon out of the water. It doesn't provide any lasting residual, so you're still looking at using one of the chlorine compounds as well. So a disinfection summary here. This is a useful little chart, I hope, for you. Uh, I've listed, did we wind it with a laser pointer here or not? Apparently not. Try the pointer. Here we go. See my arrow up at the top there? We've got the uh, disinfectants down the side here, and then the various parameters along the top. A five means it's really great. A one, mean in, one means it's pretty much useless. Uh, interesting thing is none, none of them scores a five or even a five and a four all the way across. Uh, none of them scores a one all the way across either. So this is why we're using them, obviously. Uh, but they, the disinfectant generally has to be used in combination with either more than one disinfectant or with a particle removal process in order to achieve the level of treatment that's needed. Okay, I'll move on to the particle removal processes, and they're basically in two groups, pretreatment and filtration. Pretreatment consists of uh, sometimes raw water storage and settling, not, not all, all the time. A chemical addition and a coagulant addition, and coagulants are chemicals, but they're very focused chemicals on combining material that's suspended in the water so you can, so you can take it out. And when we look at coagulant addition in conjunction with filters, we term it inline filtration or contact filtration. Those words will pop up a couple of times here. If we go on to the next step where we add, where we flocculate the water, which means slow mixing in the water, then that plus filters are called direct filtration. And finally, if we go to a full-blown clarification where we actually take particles out of the water, that's with filtration is called conventional treatment. It's just that that's been around since, I don't know, 10, 1910s, 1920s. Uh, I've, I've seen plants as old as that that use that process. Filters are basically four types, slow sand, the biological type, which you've seen at Yellow Quill for those who've been there, uh, a rapid sand or a deep bed granular media filter, and membranes. Now raw water storage has advantages of it. Number one, it, it can help dampen changes in raw water and processes like stability. So if you can have the temperature change slower because the water's had a chance to go through a, a pond, uh, that's a good thing. It also can help knock out turbidity, the cloudiness in the water, uh, by uh, allowing stuff to settle out uh, before it goes into the main process. And in some cases, if you have enough uh, storage and you have a, a quick enough acting operator, you can allow really bad water to go right by the plant if you're off a river, uh, and uh, then you'll get better quality water to deal with in, in the plant. Limitations for raw water storage, though, is it doesn't remove the colloids, which is the this very fine stuff that won't settle out. Uh, you have to use a coagulant for that. And it can provide an environment for different types of organic growth. You can get algae blooms, uh, different kinds of weeds and things growing in the, uh, in the ponds. Be a maintenance hassle, too. And they're big. You need a lot, a lot of land to store enough water uh, for a community. In southern Alberta, where I, I used to live, uh, there, there's a lot of communities there that actually use irrigation water, and they actually take enough water out of those irrigation systems to survive on for seven or eight months, and they live on, on raw water storage through the winter time. Once we get past there, the pretreatment block diagram is basically a, a reiteration of what I talked about on that introduction slide there for, uh, for uh, particle removal. Our inline contact filtration consists of chemical injection, which includes coagulant, and then rapid mixing. If we go on to direct filtration, we add in flocculation, and clarification or, or conventional treatment, we add in sedimentation or flotation. Sedimentation simply means allowing stuff to settle out. Flotation means adding in air and making it buoyant and floating it to the surface. So you can either make the stuff go down or make it go up. Now there's a whole bunch of different chemicals that, that can be injected into water. Uh, and uh, the, I've grouped these, the pre-oxidants, which look like they're disinfectants, and some of them are, ozone and chlorine dioxide, and also uh, potassium permanganate used quite a bit. There are other pre-oxidants as well. 
Uh, but they're not there primarily to disinfect the water, they're there to, to break down uh, some of the, uh, the compounds that are in the water. There are the adsorbents, and granular activated carbon is an adsorbent, and this is powdered activated carbon that's normally added in at, at the uh, front end of a plant. Really dusty stuff if you ever deal with it. And then coagulants, uh, basically grouped into the metal ions, uh, alum, which is aluminum sulfate, polyaluminum chloride, and, and there's a whole whack of uh, proprietary ones that you can get. And then the polymers, which are very long chain molecules that may ha or may not have a charge on them. Uh, the, the charged ones are either anionic or cationic, and non-charged ones are non-ionic. There can be other chemicals too. You can adjust your pH and, and things like that at this point. When you add those chemicals, then it's, it's important to mix them. And particularly with coagulants, you have to mix them very, very rapidly. This is usually a very simple, low-cost part of the treatment. You can use various types of mixes. Uh, right from static mixes, which have no moving parts, but just use energy in the water to mix the, uh, the water to, uh, to mechanical mixes, like is shown on the photograph there. And these are generally part of a more complex solution. So it's important to learn about rapid mixes, even if you're not going to use inline or contact filtration, because most of the other processes will have some type of mixing. The limitations, though, if you're just going to add in some chemical and then filter it, is you're quite limited in the amount of stuff you can load on your filters. So you may have quite uh, limited uh, dosages that you can apply. The chemical efficiency may not be optimum because you're kind of taking this stuff and dumping it on a filter right away. And your raw water needs to be appropriately good to be able to use this process. But it is commonly used, uh, at least historically it's been used a lot. Flocculation is the next step where we go through this slow mixing for typically from 5 to, to 30 minutes, depending on what your plans are for your, your treatment downstream. Uh, it's not that expensive to put in a flocculator. Very good for low turbidity uh, raw waters. The, the city of Vancouver is building a huge plant right now, uh, which is a direct filtration plant. It will use this, this process. And it is part of more complex processes, so you can go, get as far as flocculation and then go on to uh, bigger and greater things. Similar limitations though to uh, uh, inline filtration, doesn't handle turbidity spikes that well. Uh, again, limited dosages because the amount of residue that you can capture on the filters that you have to deal with. And the operation can get fairly tricky if you have a very spiky uh, raw water quality. Uh, doesn't necessarily have to be turbidity that changes rapidly, but if you get algae blooms or if you have um, diurnal temperature fluctuations, it can get uh, a little bit of a handful to operate. Now clarification goes one step further, and we're now taking these, uh, these chemicals back out of the water again, along with the particles. This gives you your best conditioning ahead of the filters, because you're removing a lot of the particles. And often in plants, the filters then get referred to as polishing filters, because you've taken the majority of what you need to get out of the water uh, upstream of it. There are a whole host of different types of clarifiers, and different types can be focused on different kinds of particles. And we're talking yesterday with the people from Prince Albert about how a solid contact clarifier is better and happier, if you like, uh, if it's got dirty water to deal with. It wants bad water because it works best if it's got something to chew on. Uh, whereas a crossflow clarifier, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, doesn't really like that at all. It wants water that's, that's pretty good. Another important thing about having a clarifier is because you're actually removing particles at this point, you are getting a barrier because certain numbers of microorganisms will be captured in that flock and taken out. Taken out. Uh, limitations though for clarification, it's more expensive. Um, as you can see on the photograph here, some of these things can get fairly, uh, fairly fancy. You have more stuff, in, more infrastructure is a better term probably, to operate and maintain. And you are taking out uh, the residues, so you now have to manage those residues somehow, uh, desludge them, dispose of them uh, somehow. This is conventional clarification, and basically it just uh, consists of uh, a, a large basin where you pour the water in at one end, it flows across the basin, is taken off the top, and the particles settle out all to the bottom where they're either accumulate or, or sometimes they're mechanically removed. These tend to be very big basins. This is a very slow process, but it's very easy to use. You just pour water in at one end, and it comes out the other, and that's about it. Uh, very low maintenance. And you can add what are called tube settlers or plate settlers, which enhance the performance of these basins significantly. And don't have time to really get into how they work, but 
they, they effectively make a, a big clarifier behave as if it was even bigger. The limitations of them, though, is they're, because they're large, they tend to be very expensive. Uh, they obviously cover a lot of area as well. And they don't do really well on light materials. So if you have a lot of algae or organics in your water, or if you're trying to take color out of your water, uh, it's very hard to get this very lightweight stuff to settle out. You need absolutely huge basins, uh, very good hydraulics to make them work. The solids contact clarifier, on the other hand, as I mentioned, likes high turbidity water. It's, it's more compact than a conventional clarifier. Uh, it would be roughly five, five times more efficient. Uh, you can also use them for lime softening. It's, it's essentially the, main, the, the same, uh, same gear. But the downsides of them is that they, they, they upset easily. Uh, if you have a, a change, if the, the flow changes even in, in your plant, if you say increase your plant flow rate by 10 or 20 percent, you can start lifting the flock out of the clarifier and blowing it onto your filters, which clogs up your filters very quickly. Uh, it's a more challenging process to correctly operate and maintain. And we see a lot of solids contact clarifiers that just aren't operated correctly. It, it's quite a technical uh, piece of equipment to run. Ballasted flocculation is a new, relatively new process. It comes from France, and it involves basically making the flock very heavy by adding in sand and a polymer to, to glue the sand uh, to the flock. It's an extremely uh, good process for taking out high turbidity. Uh, it, it kind of folds its arms and laughs at high turbidity. Uh, it's, it's a very compact process, uh, probably another six or eight times more, more compact than a, uh, than a solids contact clarifier. And it withstands changes in raw water quality extremely well. So that's, the, you know, that's another trick it does that the other clar clarifiers don't handle. And it's relatively inexpensive, because uh, it's quite simple when you, when you look at what it's made out of. Limitations, though, is you have, you have tons of sand in the system which if it's behaving itself is no problem, but if it gets away on you, you suddenly got tons of sand someplace where you didn't want, want it to be, and you can be shoveling for a lot of hours. So you have to be careful in terms of how it's operated. This, I don't want to belabor the point, it's not a major problem, but it's uh, most of the uh, active flow systems we've seen have had what the uh, operators call a sand event, where the sand goes where, where they don't want it. The sand is abrasive as well, so you have a little bit more maintenance, uh, although that's kind of planned into the, into the design. Uh, you have a large waste stream volume. You get a consistent stream of runny water. It's very runny sludge that, that comes out of these uh, clarifiers. And it's a proprietary process, which is only a problem if you have a purchasing department that wants competitive bids. It's very hard to, to get a competitive bid with a proprietary process like this. Dissolved air flotation is uh, a way of taking the sludge to the surface. And you can see on the picture here, maybe not perfectly, but this kind of greeny color on the top is, is the sludge, and then there's these scraper arms that, that carry the sludge off to the end, end of the tank. And its biggest advantage is it is really good at dealing with high organic colored algae-laden water. It lifts uh, this very lightweight material to the surface very easily. Again, it's a compact process, doesn't take up much space. It's very tolerant of changes in, in raw water quality. And unlike the active flow, which has a runny waste stream, this has a very thickened waste stream. So the residuals are already pretty easy to deal with. Uh, Achilles' heel of the DAF is heavy turbidity. Not necessarily high turbidity, but if you've got a lot of silt in, in your water that wants to sink, uh, it's very hard to float rocks. Uh, you're basically trying to take bubbles and attach them to little rocks and make them float, and it's, it's hard to do. And it uses a little bit more power than the other types of clarifiers because you have to compress a certain uh, stream of water and add air to it. On the other hand, you, you tend to use less chemical with this process, so it's a bit of a trade-off there. Moving on to filters. Uh, slow sand, biological, rapid rate, and, and membrane. Uh, slow sand filters, and I don't know if our friends from Kit Kat are still here. I think so. Um, this is their, their plant. Uh, it's a very simple, reliable process. Basically, you have a huge bed of sand and you allow the water just to sort of seep through it uh, quite gradually. And it's an interesting process in that it all occurs on the surface of the, of the sand. And it's a very biological process. And so it can remove microbes uh, without using chemical. You can add other processes to it quite easily. You can use pretreatment uh, uh, ahead of the, uh, 
the process, which is something that most so slow sand filters don't do. But in BC in particular, they've kind of created a, a niche market using uh, upstream processes of, from slow sand filtration plants. This is an Esconolith uh, plant in, in BC, uh, another s combined plant. The Achilles heel for uh, slow sand filters is algae. If you get an algae bloom, they blind off very quickly because all the treatment is occurring on the surface of the sand. The labor that's required to clean them is, is fairly uh, intensive. You can see a couple of guys there scraping the sand. And you get in there with rakes and wheelbarrows and you scrape off the top a couple of uh, centimeters, maybe an inch of, of sand and haul it out every, every few months. It's a large footprint. The, the sand, the slow sand filter is very slow rate, so it, it by its name, you can tell that. Uh, and uh, so they tend to be big. And because they're biological, uh, the bugs get kind of dopey in cold water and, and don't do a whole lot of eating and moving around. And so the performance of the filter will drop uh, in cold water. Now, the biomedia filtration is, is the newest of the, uh, of the processes. And this is uh, Hans's claim to fame here and, and Ole's uh, media. Uh, uses very little chemical. And those of you who have been to Yellow Quill have, have had the tour. And hopefully, the rest uh, will be going on Friday. Extremely low chemical use very low waste production, and a very high removal efficiency of, of specific contaminants. It's a very focused uh, uh, process. And has low oxidizing potential, which you'll see at Yellow Quill, uh, makes it ideal for use upstream of, of membrane filters, RO filters. Its limitations, it, it does need a fairly consistent quality raw water. And uh, I know research is still being done on finding the limitations of that. But, but right now, you don't want the water very flashy. And it does target specific contaminants, which is both a blessing and a curse. It, uh, it won't take out stuff that bugs don't want to eat, for example. It's a relatively new technology, uh, but uh, it's uh, working very well. This is another one of those charts that I hope you'll find uh, useful. I'll spend a moment on this. This covers the granular and membrane filters. Along the top here is size. And microns are probably easiest to understand. 1,000 microns is a millimeter. Uh, which is the size of a large grain of sand. We get right down to a ten thousandth of a micron, which is basically we're down to the size of atoms and, and molecules. And here's a bunch of stuff that gives you some idea of sizes. So sand, which is the kind of stuff you'd have in a, in a sand filter. Uh, pollens, some of the bugs, giardia, cryptobacteria, viruses are down here, much smaller. And then we get down to certain uh, salts and, and organic molecules. And then at the bottom here are our processes. Uh, this, these are fairly wide bands because there are various types of, uh, of filters. But granular filters, you can see, do a pretty good job taking out Giardia and Crypto if they're operated properly. And we'll get at quite a few of the bacteria, but less so on the viruses. Microfilters, uh, we'll, we'll get at uh, uh, the bacteria, Crypto and Giardia, but really don't do a whole lot on the viruses. Ultra filters, which cover a wide range of size. Um, most of them are kind of in this range right about here. They'll get some of the viruses, but not, or, not dissolved organics. Nanofilters will get even more stuff, and reverse osmosis gets almost everything. The electrodialysis, electrodialysis reversal, I'm not going to talk about anymore, although there are a couple of plants in Saskatchewan here. But it's not a barrier. Uh, it's, it re removes contaminants to the side. It doesn't form an actual wall that uh, prevents uh, things from getting through. So rapid rate filters, uh, very common. Use is widespread, well understood, easy to get operators who know how to, how to run these filters. And the life on them is, is great. The media can last, oh, easy 10, 15 years. The basins themselves, 50, 60, 70 years. Uh, lots of oppor opportunity to put in different kinds of media, different depths of media. And the, the move at the moment is towards deep bed filters, which might have a couple of meters, like six feet of, uh, of uh, media in them. Some of the medias, like pyrolusite, manganese, green sand, can be used for iron and manganese uh, removal within the filters themselves. And it is possible, as showed on that uh, previous graph there, to get extremely good performance. You can get down to less than 50 particles per mil, greater than 2 microns in size, uh, using filters that have you know, almost half a millimeter between the grains of, of, of sand. The downside of them is, though, uh, if you don't operate them properly, you can get breakthrough. Because the particles are so far apart, the pathogens can run right through the filter and out to, into, the, uh, into the distribution system where consumers take them in. 
Uh, they can be upset and basically wrecked by proper in operation. They, they, they may be different layers. And if you get someone who just kind of backwashes them improperly in or blows them out, blows out uh, too much air, uh, you can uh, upset the filters. And the, the pre-treatment of these filters must be correct. And a lot of people think that these filters are strainers. And they do strain out twigs and fish and leaves and, and things like that. But the process by which granular filters take out microbes and flock is actually pretty technically challenging to understand. It, it, it's a lot to do with charge on particles and attaching particles to the grains of, of media and creating a long path through the media for these particles to take. Uh, it isn't just a straining type of uh, process. And when you backwash these filters, you get a huge slug of water very briefly, typically for 10, 12 minutes, uh, and you have to deal with that residual stream. Typically, these filters will have about six valves on them that have to be operated and maintained, so moderate complexity, and a few instruments as well, obviously, as well, so you know what they're doing. Moving on to the membranes, the first classification I'm going to call the micro filters and the ultra filters, because they're very similar in characteristics. It's just the ultra filter takes out smaller particles than the micro filter does. So you get the bacteria and protozoa removed and some of the viruses, which I've already talked about. These are very custom uh, systems. Manufacturers' products vary widely, and some of them can handle extremely high turbidities very well. Uh, we've put systems in, in Alberta that see over 500 NTU water right onto the membranes, and, and they work very, very well. Relative to the other types of membranes, they have a, a very low energy use. And people would often say, well, why don't you just put reverse osmosis in, in, in everywhere? Well, reverse osmosis might use 1,000 PSI of pressure, whereas a, a microfilter might use 5 PSI. So a huge energy difference uh, used. The other thing is that a reverse osmosis system, and I'll talk about these in a moment, the water quality going onto an RO system basically has to be good enough to drink. Uh, whereas a microfilter and ultrafilter I've already described, some of them can take pretty, uh, pretty grotty water onto them. And these filters are very easy to operate. They're, they're programmed, they're modular, and uh, they, uh, you basically plug them in, switch them on, and, and, and they'll work. They're also compact, and I mentioned modular design. Limitations, though, they do allow dissolved materials uh, to pass through them. Microfilters in particular are very poor virus removal, uh, ultrafilters get some of them out. Some of the systems do require very good raw water quality. Uh, they have a fair number of little valves and instruments and, and pipes on them, uh, so uh, there's some O&M complexity. And they are proprietary systems, although there are enough manufacturers out there that you can generally get competitive bids to satisfy your purchasing department's uh, requirements. For nano and RO, uh, you get complete removal of the microbes a high removal of, the, of dissolved materials. Again, they're easy to operate, very compact. Uh, downsides for them, though, is that the feed water must be good, as I already mentioned. They use a lot of power. Uh, again, moderate O&M complexity. Uh, interesting problem, particularly with RO, is that they concentrate the contaminants in the water to the point where the reject be can become extremely saline, very, very difficult water to dispose of. You can't just dump it back into a creek or in, into a river. Well, not that that's a particularly good practice. Uh, and so you, you may have a, a situation where you have to have a tailings pond or somewhere to capture this material or further treat it or dry it out and, and have a solids uh, removal system. What are we doing for time? Just about uh, done my time slot here. Uh, so when you're looking at these processes, you have to decide which combination is right for your situation. What kind of filters, what kind of pretreatment, what kind of disinfectants, and what order everything goes in. And that's what the process engineering is about. And then do you need to augment this with other treatment, particularly for the aesthetic parameters? Some things, though, you, can, you should always keep in mind. Am I getting multiple barriers? Very important. Are these systems reliable? And how will they respond if I get a process failure? Are those barriers there to, to protect me? What are the regulations going to do? Uh, these plants, you generally are buying them for a, at least a 20-year time frame. And there are changes still in the regulations that are likely to occur. And you know, your engineers can provide you with some guidance, or your regulators can hopefully provide you with some guidance there. And the science is changing. We heard yesterday about uh, the pharmaceuticals and the pesticides and, and things like that that are getting in the water. That most of these processes are not focused on removing. I'm going to talk about wastewater briefly in a minute. And that's more where that comes into play. I've talked about operation and maintenance before. It has to be appropriate for your location and skill level. 
and you have to look at the environmental impacts. What do you do with the residuals that, that come out of these systems? Costs are also obviously uh, a factor. I briefly want to cover wastewater treatment because Hans asked me to cover it. I'm, I'm not a wastewater engineer by trade, but I hopefully can speak to it reasonably well here. Very briefly, there are three types of wastewater treatment, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary is effectively removing out what will float and what will sink. So it's a physical removal process. Secondary is now a biological process where you're using bacteria, usually accelerating the action of these bacteria to remove nutrient from the water. And then tertiary is to take out specifically phosphorus and nitrogen, uh, which are triggers for a lot of uh, aquatic uh, growth and can lead to eutrophication of, uh, of lakes and streams. This chart here basically summarizes the three processes reasonably well. Uh, <coughs> primary treatment removes your sewage solids, but not a whole lot else. Dissolved organics are removed somewhat through secondary, but really well in tertiary. Phosphorus is why you need tertiary, as well as nitrogen. Bacteria are kind of taken out all the way through, and then viruses uh, as, as well. The last stage is generally some kind of disinfection, and UV should have been added onto this, uh, chlorination, ozonation, and, and UV. Uh, so this is kind of what wastewater treatment's all about at the moment. A few things about tertiary treatment. I want to talk about the crossover between wastewater treatment and drinking water treatment. We're looking more at having to remove nutrient out of, like organic carbon out of uh, drinking water treatment, uh, of drinking water rather. Uh, so the processes that are used in tertiary treatment are biological nutrient removal and kind of the bio uh, media uh, filters are this, a bit of a, a similar type of uh, application for, uh, for uh, water treatment. The, the process itself works way differently, but the idea of using bugs <coughs> to clean up the water is, is, is the same idea. And chemically, phosphorus removal is very similar to, to a clarifier type of uh, operation. Filtration is used, and then wetlands polishing, where you take the water and you use plants to take up uh, contaminants. In the, in the water. Nutrient removal technologies from the wastewater field are, are, are cost effective and they're very well understood and can be applied uh, for drinking water if, if need be. The trace organics and inorganics though, which is what we heard about, the endocrine disruptors, pharmaceuticals, uh, personal health care products, pesticides, uh, they in the wastewater industry are looking at taking them out at the plant. It makes more sense to take out these things before they're released to the environment than to have them going through the environment and impacting all organisms and then just relying on using drinking water plants to make the water safe for humans. But they are in, the wastewater people in turn are taking technologies from the drinking water industry and applying it on the wastewater plants. And technologies include the, basically the whole suite of, uh, of processes that, uh, that we use. For them, they're finding application, them being the wastewater engineers, uh, expensive and it isn't that well understood. And then disinfection is very similar to water treatment. Uh, I already mentioned chlorination, UV, ozone. And the pretreatment that you apply in a wastewater plant is key to the disinfection, disinfectant's performance. And there are four emerg emerging trends. Uh, odor control, making that the wastewater doesn't, doesn't smell. Membranes are being applied far more now for wastewater treatment. Ironically, some of the products started off as wastewater products, became very popular as drinking water technologies, and are now moved back into the wastewater field. Water reuse, rather than taking our waste and just dumping it back into a stream or a lake, reusing the water. And finally, recognizing that it's, there's a lot of risks and costs in collecting sanitary waste and bringing it to a certain point, the wastewater people are going opposite to water treatment people, where we are centralizing, they're looking at decentralizing and putting smaller facilities out there and then collecting the sludge. And that's my presentation. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, take them.